Great, thanks, Eric. Um, great to be here. It's a great honor um, to be invited here as a keynote speaker at Iron Farmer. And I still remember the first time I attended this very nice conference about three years ago, I think. But but I knew it has been ongoing for a couple of years now, so it's great that we have this conference and, and so many activities around it. So thanks a lot for the invitation. And today um, I want to a little bit um, provoke a little bit discussion um, around, you know, how are we actually doing the daily work in the pharma companies, um, for example, in biostatistics, and and why do we actually need to improve the way we do, you know, software engineering coding uh, in biostatistics? So a little bit uh, the table of contents for today. So we'll start with some introduction, um, where I'm, then where I'm coming from with this topic personally. Um, then the statement around, you know, everybody's programming, but it's still, you know, a little bit neglected among other disciplines in, in pharma and in biostatistics. And then talk about why is this a problem and, and what can we do about it? And then just close with a few examples that, that might help us, tools and groups and developments, and then close with a kind of call to action. Yeah, and this, these slides are also done with Quarto, and I'm so happy that we have Quarto, so I, I was so happy that I could use these iframes. So that's why you have all of these colorful balls bu bumping around here. But so the start is, of course, with a disclaimer. So these opinions are mine and not necessarily those of my employer, Roche. And also some acknowledgments. So these slides and ideas are partly based on a manuscript which is called improving software engineering in biostatistics challenges and opportunities which is an archive um, and of course you get the slides later um, you have the link there and that's joint work uh, with a bunch of folks um, we, that we had a panel discussion on on research software engineering for clinical biostatistics last year at the icb conference which is a biostats conference um, and yeah so thanks to all of them for you know working with me also on this topic so what's the objective of this of this keynote, what I would like to achieve? So first, I would like to kick off a good discussion, hopefully also beyond this talk and the discussion we have afterwards, um, so that we can learn from each other. You know, how can we improve um, the practice, daily practices um, within our companies and maybe academic institutions? I would also like to reflect um, that you reflect on how biostatistics is being done on a daily basis in your place. And why biostatistics? We could also talk about other data science um, you know, areas, mainly because we are at Iron Pharma, and also that is what I know most about. So I've always been in these biostatistics kind of departments, um, and that's why I'm kind of uh, talking about that a little bit more uh, in particular. I would also like you to strive to get yourself savvy in good software engineering practices and apply them in your daily job. So that goes beyond just being able to code in R, for example. And I would like you to influence your colleagues, for example, in biostatistics or other data science domains and departments um, in your you know, home base, in your organizations, to do things better. I was looking for examples of what can happen, that I can show what can happen due to bad coding. And I was very lucky that just yesterday, um, there was a news in Switzerland where I'm, where I'm living and you know I'm also have the Swiss passport now I'm German and Swiss so it's really my home and the Swiss government needed to correct election figures on political party strength after the major uh, elections that happen every four years to elect the parliament so that's pretty bad and the difference was actually greatest for the Swiss People's Party which is the strongest party so and um, which now has 27.9 percent of the vote instead of 28.6 percent so that's a pretty big difference. Um, and how did this happen? In a press release, the government indicated that the error in calculating these uh, numbers was due to an incorrect programming in the data input program for three cantons. Um, I will spare you to read the name now with an English pronunciation, but these are small, three small, let's say, areas in Switzerland. Um, and the incorrect program caused the votes cast in the three cantons to be counted multiple times, three to five times for the parties running there. So that's a huge uh, thing here in Switzerland at the moment. So there's a huge discussion on this. Um, I, I don't want to be the statistician who did this mistake or the programmer who did this mistake. And uh, we will talk more about this difference between statisticians and programmers also later. But yeah, this can happen due to bad coding. Other examples can happen. Here's one from biostatistics, not as recent as yesterday, but 
something here from 2019, uh, where authors in the Journal of American Medical Association um, needed to retract their, um, their findings, their paper from the journal. And what happened originally, uh, and we focus here just on a few numbers, originally they had some results here on, um, on some kind of, uh, I think it was some kind of um, lower number of means of hospitalizations. So here there was some effect, which was 0.72, and it was actually significant, okay? So the p-values were here like, p-values like 0.04. So this was significant on the standard 5% significance level. But then, because now they found a mistake and they needed to correct the results, this actually reversed the findings completely the other way around. So now they have 1.4. As a, as a here, uh, uh, for example, as a result, and 0.72. So just the other way around is here, 0.72, 1.4. Now it's the other way around, 1.4 and 0.72. So they just confuse the groups. And the difference is no longer significant. So it's now 0.11, the p-value, right? And why? how did this happen? They did some recoding of the data sets. And the purpose was to change the randomization, uh, randomization assignment variable from it from a from one and two so they originally had used one and two as the formatting they wanted to have a binary format of zero one however the assignment was made incorrectly and resulted in a reversed coding of the study groups and that's of course a nightmare you know for for these uh, people and that might also be you know causing kind of wrong research directions based on the paper publication and all kinds of things right so it's 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 really pretty bad so these were just two examples so where I'm coming from with this topic personally, um, just to start a little bit with my personal path to biostatistics and pharma, how did I got he get here? So in school, you know, I was good at math. I really liked, for example, stochastics, you know, those kind of questions and exercises. What is the chance of winning the lottery and things like that? I really liked that a lot. Uh, but I always also had fun programming. So already since high school and so on, my dad taught me some basic and the school learned some Turbo Pascal. So really kind of fun stuff you can do with this. I was also interested in medicine, but on the other hand, I could faint when watching somebody draw blood from my arm. So I always have to watch you, go watch, watch somewhere else. I cannot uh, look at that. So probably I wouldn't be the best medical doctor ever. So I chose statistics because I could combine math and programming and also work, you know, among other things with medical data. Although I was formally trained as a statistician, you know, all the way from bachelor to, to PhD. And then I started working in the pharma industry as a biostatistician. What I did not do during those first years, um, I did not really store my programs in version control systems, at least not consistently. I did not worry too much about making my code readable by others. I was mainly just working on it alone. Um, I did not really try to make my calculations reproducible. Most of the time it should work because it just usually it just works, right? But I didn't think too much about versions of R or packages or you know stuff like that. Um, I did not get any code review of my study design simulations, so I just I just did it my own. I presented to the team. You know things were included in protocols and stuff, and you know things are all right. But I did not get any code review on that. I did not write any unit tests for my packages, so I did already some packaging work. Um, I'll come back on that later. But I did not really have any habit of any writing any tests, right? Some tricks I learned in tech afterwards. So after about five years uh, in pharma, I had the opportunity to switch gears, work at Google. And because it's Google, I thought, OK, give it a try. I learned a lot quickly about things like how to write unit tests, a lot of unit tests, a lot of edge cases, how to use a consistent coding style, and why that's important. You know, even things like forgetting like a full stop. I still remember my manager telling me, no, that you need to fix. How to write design documents. So have a plan first before you actually start coding anything. Very useful thing to have. How to name functions. It's a hard thing, but it's also super important. Makes your code so much more readable and so much more intuitive. How to review code and how to respond to review feedback. Also lots of code review, lots of feedback. Very important, how to check in code into the internal repository. I mean, of course, at that time, I had used things like Subversion and some Git before. But of course, if you do this on a daily basis, um, all the time, you, you, you get much more uh, fluent. 
I, I learned a lot of other things maybe that are not that important, you know, how to write SQL queries, macros, and unit tests for those macros. That's uh, a lot of pain, um, but of course, it's also good to, good to do it if you really have those SQL macros. Uh, there's a lot of memes in Google, and nowadays I think memes are everywhere, uh, how to create new memes and so on. So I did some of that as well. Maybe it's not a, that important. Um, but Pharma is more fun for me, so I really like the little, little, little lot of programming in a structured way at Google, but I miss the scientific aspects of Pharma, so where we deal not just with numbers, but also with biology, medicine, patients, medical doctors, and so it's a multidisciplinary environment. That's, that's really great. And Roche just started venturing more into our territory. So the keyword is Nest Project. Um, you have probably seen a lot on this already uh, in the Pharmaverse days. Um, so lots of cool developments there, and, and there was really a lot of uh, you know, opportunity. So I switched back to Roche uh, after about two years in, in Google, uh, and also because it's really a great place to work. I see lots of potential to apply tech skills in pharma. So, and this is really also the topic of this presentation that we can do more in pharma, and we can learn a lot from tech. And the question is, how can we improve the way we work with code and pharma? So that was kind of my, my path a little bit. And now one thesis, one kind of uh, hypothesis I have, which is programming is everywhere, it's ubiquitous, but it's still neglected. So know that I'm trying to zoom in here on the pain points. Um, this is mostly based on anecdotal stories, not just from here, but also from different organizations. But this is not based on any surveys or quantitative evidence you know, that I collected in a structured way. And I hope that in the discussion here and later, we can learn more from each other. If your experience is maybe similar or you share some of the pain points I have here, feel free to share your pain points. If your experience is different, maybe more uh, you know, positive, you have maybe some great examples, what works very well, that's really great. And I would really love to learn uh, more about it. So the other hypothesis, um, the, so the part of the hypothesis is almost all biostatisticians code. So everybody's programming. Um, so, I mean, for sure, we don't use calculators anymore, right? So we, we have to use uh, software. Um, of course, there's a lot of graphical tools that we can use for simple tasks, for clicking clicking around, and maybe we get some very, very simple things done. But of course, it won't be sufficient for most biostatistics use cases. We learn programming maybe already in high school or latest in undergraduate courses. Um, and then we wrangle, analyze, visualize, predict. We do a lot with biomedical medical data with code every day. But I would say many don't take it serious enough. Most of the coding we do alone without any discussion or review. We often copy and paste code from each other and adapt it every time, kind of as a snowball thing. Uh, we often distinguish ourselves from statistical programmers and give them instructions. And maybe we even feel we are kind of better than them. Right? And this is again, zooming in on biostatisticians in particular in pharma. There is a big divide often still between statistical programmers and statisticians. And there's also kind of a hierarchy um, that many people perceive, um, you know, that biostatisticians are better, uh, you know, on a, on a higher rank than, than statistical programmers. We often shy away from sharing our code because we think it's too ugly and maybe the others shouldn't see it. We often don't take enough time to write clean code because we are too busy. That's kind of connected with the previous point. So we are busy with other things, right? More important things like meetings, um, um, re revising analysis uh, protocols, um, looking, reviewing um, things that are coming from statistical programmers and stuff. We often just develop code locally on our laptops. We don't maybe check them into version control systems that are centrally available for everyone. So these are just some observations, um, you know, and and trying to zoom into some pain points. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's what I just mentioned. Rarely use version control systems. So, why is this a problem? So, why are these behaviors uh, that we often see in biostatistics and pharma? Why why is this a problem? First problem: we cannot hover easily to other statisticians. Of course, statisticians, you know, too. We are just humans. We take vacations. We go on longer leaves. We switch companies. Other statisticians need to back us up, right? Or take over the project. And these can be peers, can be your manager. They might need to revisit the design. Maybe you, you programmed, you found out, uh, you got some sample size, for example, or some 
probabilities of stopping early, go, no go, um, probabilities or risks or whatever, or some analysis, exploratory analysis, or even confirmatory things. Um, and they need to modify the code. Maybe they don't find the code at all because it's not in a version control repository. Maybe it's just left on your laptop. Maybe it's, just, maybe it's in some file system, but it's not clearly named. Uh, they might not be able to understand the code because it's just so, so difficult to read. It's unreadable by others. Second problem, you cannot maintain the code then if you, if you, don't, if you have these ha bad habits, right? So not just switching between different statisticians, but also over time, if you, even, even if it's yourself on the same project, things can become difficult. At least when I personally read code from one or two years ago, um, it's almost like code from another person. It, you know, indistinct if it's a uh, good code or bad code, but it's, it feels like, oh, wow, this is like, I haven't seen this for a while, uh, looks, looks pretty new. Uh, if I look back at my quickly written and ugly code, which is not documented, I have a very hard time to modify that or to go from there. Uh, if you change to the copy and paste code, um, it won't help, help anybody else, right? So, so as as we as we just copy and paste things from each other, and you modify that, nobody else will benefit from it, right? Even if you improve it a little bit, it won't help anybody else. For example, if you discover any bugs, those cannot be fixed across projects in one go. If you maybe add some cool new features, they won't be inherited by the other projects. Third problem, we cannot prevent bugs with this. So if we change the code, because we don't have any tests, we don't know if it still works correctly. We have no idea, right? Typically, we just, you know, we run the whole script again. If it does not fail with an error message, probably it's fine, right? But it might still produce wrong results due to some new bugs introduced by our changes, but we don't know. And if we fix a bug, so we probably find a lot of bugs, you know, sooner or later because, because of this, these habits. But if we fix a bug and we don't add a test for it at the same time, it might just come back later. That's a typical kind of regression problem, right? That the code just regresses to previous problems. And as well, this is all even more important in software packages uh, that we create for us and others um, because some people depend on it and we don't know if things still work, if there's still bugs in it. Fourth problem, we cannot reproduce results reliably, right? So when we don't prepare for it, if there's new versions of R, new versions of R packages, they can lead to different results. This can be a real problem. For example, when we have some inspection coming up and they ask us, well, how did you calculate this thing? You know, can you show us how you do it? You know, maybe, maybe we can't. Very hard to reproduce manual steps, you know, executing this script and maybe copy pasting that thing somewhere else running another script, um, getting a data set, running another script and so on. That's very hard um, and it still often happens. Um, so we this, this would need to be thoroughly documented to have a small chance of reproducibility, but that's usually omitted and not done. But we have to realize statistics is a key component of the scientific value chain, right? So we have a, we have a huge responsibility to ensure reproducibility, right? And there's a huge reproducibility crisis in science overall we're part of this chain, right? We need, make, we need to make sure we, we cover our chain part, you know, very reliably. Fifth problem, we cannot submit to external stakeholders with confidence, right? So, I mean, if we cannot share reliably internally in the company with your peer or manager, then probably less so with external stakeholders, right? Of course, so far analysis that need to be shared with regulators, they're often rewritten by statistical programmers. Right, because actually we don't trust our statisticians enough. That duplicates the work with the original coding, also has additional risk of introducing even new bugs. Right? It's it's on the other hand, it's also usually not done for study protocol content. So all kind of design things like sample size simulations, I have not seen that being rewritten by statistical programmers. And then often reporting code, the other I mean the other thing happens normally, often reporting code. Uh, in the past was translated to proprietary software because that was considered the only validated way, right? So we couldn't do things anymore with R, we need to switch to proprietary software uh, implementations. Uh, but those things can still have bugs like any other software has. Um, and of course the actual analysis scripts and macros, even if it's based on a, propri on a proprietary system, those actual things we code, they can still have um, uh, bugs, right? So the point here is, um, um, 
yeah, it, we're not, we cannot be confident sharing this externally. Um, and those things we are doing typically just pushing into statistical programmers. Usually we only do that for part of the thing and that's not the real solution either. That's like a workaround. So what can we do about it? Okay, so now I, I showed you a lot of problems. I feel we still have in biostatistics, how we do the coding, what can we do about it? I would say the first thing to do is just become aware that there are issues, right? Get conscious about that. I would say most statisticians in pharma they actually have examples where lax programming led to such problems. Let's realize that a lot is at stake. We are, I mean, okay, we are not building airplanes that could fall from the sky with, with some coding uh, mistakes, but we are still impacting the life of patients. And that's also pretty, pretty important, right? It matters for patients that we calculate the right sample size, right? Do we have too many um, patients in our study, too few? That we more generally determine the right clinical trial design, because again, that impacts the sample size, impacts how the patients are actually treated and how they actually, you know, do actually, you know, what, what they're doing during the clinical study. So that's very important, impacting their life. Um, and also, if you think more from the pharma company perspective, we want to really help finding the right molecules based on the preclinical experiments, for example, right? So the, the stuff I talked before about we push stuff to statistical, statistical programmers, that's not even happening in preclinical uh, statistics, right? Preclinical statistics, usually there's no such thing as statistical programmers. There's only statisticians, um, but I would claim that many of these bad practices still will be there. Um, and that's a huge risk because we might just not zoom into the right molecules from the start. And then we minimize our chances uh, to get a new medicine to the patients, right? So it, it matters for the pharma company, but it matters of course, mostly also for the patients. Do they get new better medicines or not? Right, and there's many other things. So it matters for patients. So it's a it's a big it's a big thing that is here at risk. Um, it's not just me uh, saying these kind of things. Um, I was happy to find um, a paper from from my you know previous um, collaborator and and uh, supervisor Leo Held um, and and his colleague Simon Schwab, where they point out that yeah, coding mistakes can lead to false results, and you can have some small mistakes. There can be some very big impacts. So this is a paper in significance. You can have a look at that if you're interested. And um, yeah, so I think we also, so we, we become aware of the thing and then take software engineering seriously, right? So we, I think we actually know what we should do. So I would say, let's just take the time and energy to actually do it, okay? So we need to make the next step. We have the tool and we have the tools and we will look later at some examples. We have many things available. And, and we th we know in principle what we should do. Let's just take the time and energy to do it, right? And I think we can actually learn a lot from the so-called statistical programmers, right? We can also organize ourselves with standards, right? Statistical programmers have a lot of standards. I think it starts with naming conventions for files and folders. Where is actually this stuff sitting, you know, on your file system or, or version control system, whatever, you know, how do people actually find the stuff when you go in there, right? Very simple things. And there's, of course, data set conventions and so on on top of that, uh, programming conventions. But there's a lot of standards that I think we can we can learn something there. We can also automate repetitive tasks. And again, statistical programmers have done this for a long time already. And we can also consider double programming of key results, right? So if I have my, you know, several millions uh, phase three study at risk, maybe it's not a bad idea to have a second statistician, maybe even reprogram the sample size calculation, right? On top of that with some code review, et cetera, right? Processes around this should consider code in the same priority as documents, right? So we have a lot of um, processes around things like statistic analysis plans, of course, protocols, like try protocols, many other things like randomization, et cetera. But I think, code should be in the same code should be considered as important as those documents because code in the end will lead to decisions will lead to impact for external stakeholders and patients so that should also be considered a priority of course not every program right i mean of course if you play around with some stuff you just throw it in the bin afterwards nobody cares but as soon as this goes to the you know molecule team as soon as this goes into some discussions about what's the right thing to to carry into phase one or something. I mean, that's really that's really high priority. 
but that really implies then, I mean, if you say that's 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 the same priority as documents, it kind of automatically implies that you should review it, right? We have a lot of review cycles on documents. We should also have review on code. Uh, there's a lot of scrutiny around the style in documents. There should be similarly enough scrutiny and good uh, and consistent code style. Um, we definitely always want to make sure we back up you know, ourselves and, you know, somebody gets sick and again, leaves the company or whatever. So business continuity, ensuring business continuity also for code, I think it's super, super important. And I think besides that, um, besides learning from, let's say, statistic programmers, besides elevating code in terms of priority, um, same level as documents, I think we should also be strive to be on par with tech companies with regards to the coding quality and, and, and the way we do it. Um, another article here from Significance, um, Heidi Seibold et al. Um, on you know statisticians, roll up your sleeves. There's a crisis to be solved, um, where they again, again point out you know we are key, we play a key role in almost all scientific research. Um, there is the reproducibility crisis. We need to do a lot of things better, um, and this also actually includes some some part on, on code. Um, so so that's also a great recommendation to read. Um, the other thing we, we should do is I think we should, you know, improve the way we educate the new generation, the way we educate ourselves, very important. And of course, it starts very early, right? And, and of course, if we are now here for us, it's too late, but maybe, you know, for our kids and so on, we need to think about that. It starts with secondary schools, right? I think computer science, that should become a standard subject, not just an extra. And maybe in some countries and geographies, it's already that, but it's, I think it should be the same importance as math or geography or physics. Continues with university, undergraduate graduate programs, right? Computer science must be a key component of statistics and data science programs. And I would say good software engineering practices, there weren't dedicated courses, right? So we don't just want to have the abstract underpinnings of, you know, computer science with semaphores and stuff that I already forgot about what they actually mean. But we should also have the very, very hands-on practical uh, best practices or good practices um, courses um, to really, to really, and not just understand syntax, but also really kind of uh, do things in a, in a good way and sustainable way. And then it continues with the postgraduate education during the work life, right? It, learning never ends, fortunately, because that way it stays interesting. So I think we should sign up for, you know, and, and look at online courses, you know, software engineering workshops, conference sessions, etc. So I think it's important to, to keep on the ball here um, and, and educate yourself um, you know, continuously on, on these kinds of topics. Within the organizations, I think establishing dedicated teams um, can be a good uh, help, you know. Um, and we have seen that in academia, research software engineering, it's a thing. Um, it, it's quite established now in academia, also in the data science institutions. Um, and similarly, pharma companies are establishing software engineering focused teams. And I think that's, that's good. Uh, often the direct focus is development of reusable software like our packages or Python packages or shiny things and stuff. And that's that's good. I think we should not stop there. I think that shouldn't be everything, but I think we should also strive to improve the day-to-day -day work, right? How do we do biostatistics? Again, what I said before, all of these things, right? How do we do medical writing? How do we actually put the stuff into the clinical study reports, right? Is it still all copy paste? Can we do something better there? Can we automate things? Can we also again work open source on these things? Of course, how do we analyze and design preclinical experiments? I think that's a huge uh, lever for the you know for the pharma companies or for research in general. Not just always focus on late stage and you know phase one to phase three, but but also think of a lot about can we do mu things much better with a lot of impact for the preclinical stage. Um, and yeah, and of course we need good people for this, right? I think software engineering work is quite complex, right? We need to understand the domain, uh, at least to the extent that our work is, 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 is needing that. But we also need to understand a lot about computing. We need to understand a lot about math. We need to understand a lot about the, the programs and stuff. So we need top talents for this, right? And how do we provide attractive career paths so we get people into these things um, that that's another question, right? And uh, another thing we should do, I think um, it it also depends a little bit how you define the job role, right? I think on the one hand we could think about or frame this in a, in an evolution of statistical programmer roles, right? 
in the past, the statistical program was mostly just execute macros and, and let's say wrangle data sets and then run, let's say, standard programs um, to, to, to produce uh, tables and graphs. But I think we could also think about statistical programmers picking up more and more also development of packages, um, working directly together with statisticians on exploratory analysis and stuff like that, right? We could also think about a convergence of statisticians and statistical programmers, right? And for example, at Roche, I'm personally very happy that we actually had recently had some kind of a little bit reorg where we can now have kind of mixed teams where we have, you know, same manager managing both statisticians and statistical programmers. We call them analytical data scientists, um, but yeah, still kind of statistical programmers. Um, and, and I think this, this kind of, I think this can be a good model to kind of have much more collaboration on a, on a very daily basis um between between them and have maybe even have some kind of convergence right so decisions picking up more programming skills and bad and good practices the decision program is picking up more stats and, and all this kind of things or we could also think of a new definition of statistical software engineers right so really people focusing um on this intersection between statistics and and engineering i think it's important to make these things attractive right so should have the same compensation packages as for biostatisticians or, for example, methodology experts and stats. Should also have the same respect in the hierarchy of disciplines, right? Of course, there's nobody formally saying statistical programmers are not equal to statisticians, but on the ground, on a daily basis, and sometimes in some companies, even on the pay level, there's still a big difference. But I think that's not that's not good. We need to make sure we have good people here uh, that should be attractive. and. Also, the same career levels should be possible, including leadership roles. And then, of course, zooming in on the collaboration across companies, right? The whole open source, that's why we're here today. We want to learn from each other. That's why we have R and Pharma. That's why we have open source and pharma organization. That's that's really great. It's much more natural now that we use R and other open source software. Um, it has been made so much easier in the last decade, especially, you know, things like video conferencing, cloud-based documents, code sharing platforms much better than, for example, 20 years ago. Stakeholders ask for companies to work together towards standards rather than receiving different solutions from each company, right? FDA doesn't want to have a new um, package, um, you know, doing survival analysis from each company. They just want to, that, you know, people publish the thing first, work together on things, and then have some kind of, you know, more or less standard things, more or less harmonized solutions, and then they, you know, have much less pain when they review uh, submissions, for example. Uh, loosely coupled software modules are important to really plug and play things and make them fit, right, um, to, to, the, to the company standards. And um, we can still connect to internal things by a company specific extensions, right, of those um, standard um, software modules. Um, yeah, and I think that's really, um, I think the collaboration across companies, I think that's the key opportunity in contrast to what we had, you know, before, right? The, the previous proprietary software-based company siloed stack that, you know, pharma companies had. I think now moving away from that, it's not just switching to R as the, as the programming language, but it's also having much more collaboration. I think that's really what can make a big difference and, and drive the efficiency much more. Okay, just a few examples um, of what can help us to get there, uh, or, or maybe also some 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 success stories. Let's say, um, and uh, so starting with some of my the work that I have been involved with, CRM PAC. Um, CRM stands for con Continual Reassessment Method, so it's a Bayesian design for dose escalation. We started ten years ago. Uh, we had some custom R scripts running Jaxcode to run MCMC. Then we realized pretty quickly, we need to have a way to avoid this copy paste of these custom scripts, right? We, we need an R package. And we published CM pack to Cron in, in 2015. Um, we, we wrote a paper, it was published in 2019. Other companies also started to use it. Um, the University of Cambridge was also very good because they did some courses and taught you know, others um, to, to use the package. And then we actually joined forces about the end of 2021, so about two years ago to develop the package further together. And now we have like a cross industry uh, developer group and we presented this already at a couple of conferences. So that's, that was really like a great experience for me personally um, to, be, to be involved in this. The working group OpenStatsWare, um, was happy to be a part of that. 
Um, we founded this um, in August 2022 as a working group in the ASA biopharmaceutical section. We have around 40 members now from over 25 pharma companies, CIO, etc. We're also open for new members if you're interested. And we focus really on first building packages together, already on Cron or MMM and BRMS MMM, and also disseminating good software engineering practices. Right. So we, we did some workshops and videos already. I think I'll have more a little bit more on it later. Uh, more details on MMM in the talk and also on the working group open statswear by Ya Wang from Tuesday. If you missed that, it will be uh, in the recording in a, in a few months. Um, uh, there's a lot of tools for reproducible research, right? So many great tools exist. There's also Cron task view on this, right? Things started 20 years, more than 20 years ago with, with Sweep. I still remember Fritz Leisch giving some lectures on this uh, in, in Munich when he was there and I was a student there. Then uh, already much later here, but in the timeline, but there were also probably things in between. Knitter and Markdown, 2014, it's not that long ago. PackRat to carry over our package versions and stuff, 2014. Officer produce uh, office documents from our super powerful 2017. Used this package also 2017. RNF, uh, really very useful. Uh, 2019 targets, uh, you know, the pipeline for reproducible uh, results, 2020, and of course, Quarto, right? And, and that's what I'm using here for the presentation as well, which is really great tool, 2021. So many, we have many tools for this, You're really and, and ensuring the reproducible of statistic analysis. There's also lots of tools for package developers, right? That you have really good practices for your packages. It becomes easier and you get better packages. Test that from 2009, very, very uh, mature already now. DevTools, just two years later, 2011, also around for a long time. Things like Checkmate, very useful for assertions. Make sure your functions don't get in some bogus things, and then you have some bugs downstream that you have no idea where they're coming from. Linter, check your code uh, style. Spelling, for the spelling mistakes, styler, uh, constructively kind of improved the, the, you know, the code style. Package down, also super useful, 2018. Pre-commit. Check your things before committing. 2020, very many things, right? There, and there's and there's let's say lower uh, let's say lower hanging fruit even, right? Templates, right? Templates I think can be a great way to start to centralize code for reoccurring use cases, right? You don't always have to put everything into packages. Sometimes aligning on some template uh, and then you kind of maintain the template can be super helpful. In the Nest uh, ecosystem, we have the TLG catalog and also Biomark analysis catalog, super powerful. Um, you can also find them by Google very easily. Um, R-packed vignettes, you know, for example, for clinical trial design, super helpful. Mediana case studies for simulations of trials. Falcon, FDA safety tables and figures. So these kind of templates that are maintained over time, where people can, you know, emerge in, let's say, proposed uh, improvements and so on, I think can be super helpful as well. And then last but not least, guidelines for good practices, right? Um, our OpenSci is a nonprofit initiative fund in, in 2011, also quite uh, quite mature already, and they have staff process and guidelines for statistical software peer review of our packages. Right, I think we can also learn a lot from them. They have really great guidelines, also you know on how to write good packages. The Turing Way um, started in 2019 as a guide for reproducibility, covering version control, code testing, CI. Now it encompasses much more. Right, reproducible research, project design, communication, collaboration, ethical research. Big thing. Um, there's also some nice papers. For example, I found this one, Best Practices in Statistical Computing from Sanchez et al. two years ago. They have five steps, they propose five steps for implementing a code quality assurance process. Adherence to clean and consistent code style, clear written documentation, careful version control, good data management, regular testing and review. So similar components, what I, what I mentioned before, right? Workshops teaching good practices. So uh, as mentioned from OpenStats, where we have run actually five workshops this year on good software engineering practices for our packages in particular. It was a lot of fun. Um, the Carpentries, um, that's, you know, do, they teach foundational coding and data science skills to researchers worldwide. Um, and there's a lot of material available, software, data, libraries. Um, you can you can take material from there. There's also a new Coursera course, um, where I was also a little bit involved making data science work for clinical reporting. Uh, have a look at that as well. So I know I'm a little bit short on time. Um, 
And I just want to close with a call to action. So I would say, let's be honest about how we are doing things in, on a daily basis in our companies, for example, in biostatistics, but also beyond. Let's realize that a lot depends on doing the software engineering well, right? It's not just programming. It's not just coding. There's a lot of things around that, right? Let's get savvy with this. Let's, let's get savvy with the tools, good practices, ourselves first to improve our habits, and then let's influence others, right? Let's influence our colleagues and managers in our companies to improve things. And then let's, let's realize the benefits from improved software engineering and biostatistics. Thanks. Wow, Daniel, that was absolutely an amazing talk. And I must say, you have generated a lot of chat messages. Um, what great, great dialogue <laughs> in our audience. I feel like you've hit a nerve, perhaps. Um, but no, in a, in a good way, of course. Um, I, I want to take like a minute or two just to surface. I think the biggest issue that was talked about was kind of the consensus or the, the um, atmosphere, I guess, that some people are feeling where there is still a divide that's happening between the quote unquote classical statisticians and now the statistical programming side. I've definitely seen this as well. I do feel there are some strides to making this a little more synergistic, but I guess um, on top of the advice you've, your, and notes you've shared here, for those that are still struggling with this, um, do you have advice on how they can maybe persevere to maybe maybe open the eyes of others in their organization or maybe, um, you know, spread the message of what you're showing here? Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, good, good question. Um, um, I'm not sure. I mean, um, I think, I think um, you know, for example, for me personally, it, it helps a little bit that I was first in a statistics role and then moved more into this programming scene um, because, I think people take me maybe a little bit more seriously than in biostats when I talk with them about these things. Um, but I, I think I think maybe we need to really try and and, and I'm definitely I mean I'm, I would definitely say you know I mean, even though for example James yesterday he shared great things that have happened at Roche right and I think things have improved but I think we're still not yet at the end um, and still not yet where it's perfect and okay it will never be perfect but I think we have to also convince the leadership people. Um, you know those that are in charge of things um, that this is really important um, and 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 then have to also do influence some stuff top down as, as much as we can right and maybe those people that are in leadership statistical programming roles can help us on the way right um, but but I think um, just just talking with individual people is probably not enough but I think we need also enough processes and um, you know standards that are kind of lift also not not just maybe some document that sits somewhere and then really try slowly to really change the habits of people, right? Maybe with some kind of onboarding for newcomers that come into the company, maybe it can start like that. But I, th I think, I think there, it's kind of, a it's quite a heavy lifting, I think, for this to, to really happen, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, very, very good points, Daniel. And I do, I do have a similar background as yourself, you know, classical trained statistician learning a lot of these best practices on the fly because yeah i wasn't taught those in, in grad school in terms of engineering development but for anybody that thinks that a statistician doesn't need the skills that you're talking about here i think those days are over i think now we are much more hands-on with all aspects of drug development especially in my world where i'm involved in the design side of it we absolutely need to take the cutting edge and innovation from algorithms and best practices but i think we're all yep. in those similar situations so maybe yep. it's a new time now and maybe that's going to help as others get additional perspectives on it right yes awesome well um as as you said daniel your slides are available online so definitely get those links if you haven't already and we'll be sharing those in slack and and of course the recording of this will be posted within um as soon as yours truly gets it done editing it <laughs> but absolutely it's been been great to have you daniel and um hope you stick around for the rest of the conference and like i said there's been excellent discussion in the chat that i'm sure we'll welcome your input too